I'll say hello to everybody and welcome to this webinar with our renowned bee expert, Professor Dave Goulson. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Um, Hi. <laughs> my name's Emma K. Thomas, and I'm an artist and creator of With Nature 2020, which is an international collaborative art book aimed at raising awareness of biodiversity. Before I get properly started with introductions, though, I'd just like to explain very briefly what we're going to do today. I'll talk with Dave for about 20, 25 minutes, and then he'll be happy to take questions. And the good thing about doing this on Zoom, although I have to say I'm a total Zoom novice, is that you can write your questions down as soon as they pop into your head. You don't have to wait until the end of the talk, just put them in the chat, and then uh, I'll work through them as best I can after the main discussion. Around the world at the moment, as part of the With Nature 2020 project, there are a lot of rather special people who are preparing to create a series of giant images of endangered plant and animal species on the 22nd of May, which is the International Day for Biodiversity. For the most part, these will be physical images, mosaics, that are going to be created at 5 p.m. local time in locations beginning in Auckland, New Zealand, and moving across the world to the west coast of the USA during the course of the day. They'll be filmed aerially and they'll be live streamed so that you and hopefully a lot of other people will be able to watch them by following us on social media. So you can do that at With Nature 2020. The Copenhagen image is going to be a great yellow bumblebee in Danish Kloerhomlen and in scientific speak Bombus Distinguendus, which is such a fantastic name that I think it's kind of one of the reasons that it leapt out at me when I was looking at the Danish red list of endangered species. I just thought what a fantastic name. And uh, also being endangered sort of across the, north, the northern hemisphere, I mean, in Norway and in Britain, it also seemed kind of relevant. And it's for the reason, this reason, the bumblebee, that we're joined by Dave today to talk about bumblebees. In his academic capacity, Dave's been researching bumblebees for many years, and he's Professor of Biology, Evolution, Behaviour and Environment at the University of Sussex in southern England. His concern over the decline in bumblebee populations led him to establish the Bumblebee Conservation Trust in Britain in 2006, which um, through a combination of research and advice and public awareness campaigns is working to improve the situation for bumblebees. He's also a prolific public communicator and advocate for the bumblebee. His books include A Sting in the Tail, Humlen Vil de Hila in Danish. And I know this is popular because my neighbor here in Copenhagen has lent me her copy. And um, most recently, um, Gardening for Bumblebees, which is Den Kriblena Heo in Danish. So thanks so much for joining us, Dave. Gardening for Bumblebees, great. <laughs> and uh, we'll, hey. talk about, we'll talk about Gardening for Bumblebees later. I really would like to. But I'd like to start with, um, um, I'm reading Sting in the Tail in the mo at the moment. And um, you talk at the beginning of that book as, about how, as a boy, you were fascinated by insects. Um, and you say you don't really know what attracted you to them. It was just something sort of innate. Um, but something must have captured your imagination. What do you think it was? I, I honestly don't, I still don't know. I don't think I ever will know. I mean, it's just, just one of those things that I think actually quite a lot of children are Kind of drawn to nature they they go through a kind of bug phase or a, you know where they want to catch things and keep them in jam jars and give them names and feed them and watch them grow and i i so it just comes out of nowhere and it doesn't get everybody but it gets a lot of people i think if they have the the chance the opportunity you know if, if un unfortunately these days many children grow up in cities where they perhaps don't see many insects so if they, they don't get the opportunity to have that bug phase um but i i did i was lucky i lived in the countryside and i you know for whatever reason i remember one one of my earliest um memories is, is i just started primary school so i think i was about five years old and i saw these little caterpillars 
um, growing on some, it, it was just some weeds on the edge of the playground. And I, I, so I collected them all up and put them in my lunchbox and took them home and fed them leaves. And eventually they, they turned into, into beautiful red and black moths. I must have worked out, I suppose, that they needed to eat whatever I found them on, um, which is a common uh, weed we call groundsel. Uh, or maybe my parents helped me. I, the me my memories are a bit vague, but uh, uh, but I, I just thought it was kind of magic when these moths emerged, and uh, uh, I, I was hooked, and I have been lucky enough to to be able to make a living out of chasing around after insects, which is is for me at least is perfect. That's so wonderful. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting what you say. You kind of put your finger on it there. I think about saying that a lot of children now maybe don't get that contact with nature from the very beginnings. They just, you know, they, um, they don't have those chance encounters, which George Monbiot talks about in his book, Feral. He says the thing about, you know, playing in nature as a child is the unpredictable encounters that you have, the discoveries that are all your own. I love that quote. You, you never know what's what you're going to find if you're lucky enough to 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 you know go out and grub around pond dipping and pond dipping is one of those things that, again which I loved doing as a kid and it's like it's sort of um you know every every time you pull the net in there's, there's the possibility the exciting chance there might be something new in there that you've not seen before and you never quite know it's it's like opening a Christmas present or something you know um, and if you're really lucky there might be a new tour uh, just recently, actually, I, I um, uh, caught the, the, fir the first great silver water beetle that I'd ever seen. I'm afraid I don't know the Latin name, but it's, it's the biggest beetle in, in the UK, perhaps the biggest beetle in Denmark, I don't know. An aquatic beetle. And I, 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 did, I endlessly pond dipped when I was a kid. Never caught one of these beetles. They're really rare. And then just last, it was last summer, I was pond dipping with my 10-year-old, who's in his bug phase at the moment. And there was this 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 beautiful shiny big beetle, just as if as if by magic, and uh, wow. you know that kind of you know excitement. We filmed it, we photographed it, we put it on Twitter. We you know uh, it was brilliant. It's something he'll probably remember. As an I adult. hope so. Yeah, yeah. And, and but it, the sad thing is, as you say, that not every child gets that chance, and unless you've got parents that are able to encourage you or a, a particular teacher or something that that you know um is is keen to to sort of um, pass on that that knowledge then a lot of kids just don't get the chance and, and maybe they you know were a budding david attenborough or charles darwin or or whatever but they, they'll never turn into that person because they you yeah. know for, as an early age they never got the chance yeah yeah it's something to think about. Um, let's move on to the bumblebees a bit, because they ended up as the subject of your, you know, the main subject of your research. Um, and, and what was it that sort of drew you? Because there were so many in insects that interested you as a child. And, um, and then I think you did research into a type of butterfly or moth, was it? And, and, and so what, what led you down the bumblebee path? Yeah, I, I wasn't particularly focused on bumblebees at all until I was in my, actually my late 20s. Um, I, I did my PhD on butterfly ecology, and I guess butterflies were my first love, really, because they're so, I, being shallow, I was drawn to the beautiful colours. But eventually kind of came to realise that butterflies were, they're, 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 they're pretty simple creatures, really. They're kind of, you know, rather stupid insects, certainly compared to bumblebees sort of beautiful but airheaded um, whereas bumblebees are really clever and I, the reason I, I actually learned that and it's something that anyone can see um, so if you, you go into your garden find a patch of flowers with some bumblebees buzzing about and just watch one and you'll see that she flies from flower to flower but quite often she'll fly close to a flower with our antennae out gets quite close, but at the last minute, she, she veers off as if there's something wrong with it. Um, and I saw that and I thought, I wonder why, you know, what's wrong with that flower? Um, and I, I tried kind of reading books about bumblebees and scientific papers, and I couldn't find any explanation. So I, and I ended up spending five years 
studying it with I had a, a PhD student called Jane Stout and between us we we kind of worked out in the end what it was and it, it, it um, so basically what they're doing is they fly up and they sniff the flower for the for the smelly footprint of a recent bee visitor and if, if they can smell that someone's been there recently then that previous bee will have taken the, the nectar so the flower will be empty and there's no point wasting time climbing into it and trying to drink because there'll be nothing there. So it just saves them maybe half a second, which doesn't sound like much, but if you're visiting 10,000 flowers a day, then I, I mean, I, I now know that that's just kind of one aspect of the many kind of clever tricks that bumblebees have to help them find and extract the nectar and pollen from flowers with with great efficiency you know they can navigate across the landscape they can memorize landmarks they can remember which are the most rewarding flowers and all sorts of other things they're they're basically really smart so out of interest because um yeah i was i was very struck by your account of that that research in the book and i was going to ask you about it and i was also going to say that's just very nice having read the book i have noticed that i'm noticing bumblebees so much more this year and I saw one the other day doing exactly what you described there, sort of going around, not going into, it was some kind of lily, I think. It was some kind of quite ornamental lily, one of those ones that has kind of a beautiful kind of almost like a crown. And, um, and I actually showed my children, I was like, can you see they're not going into, because until reading your book, I hadn't actually thought of flowers as sort of taps that fill up you know, and then they get emptied and then they fill up again. But of course, it makes perfect sense. Um, so um, so that's not really a question, is it? But um, I suppose, as you were talking then, I was thinking butterfly is relatively simple and bumblebees are sort of much more complex. Is that because they're, they've been around longer? Have they had just longer to kind of evolve? Because... Um, in your book, you kind of talk about honey, honeybees being the first type of bee to evolve from wasps, and then bumblebees come along quite a lot later, I think, but still an awfully long time ago, like 35 million years. <laughs> so is that why they're complex? Yeah. Uh, honeybees didn't evolve 100 million years ago, but the first bees were roughly 100 million years ago. Um, we're not exactly sure when the first honeybees appeared. The first bumblebees, as you say, were relatively recent, um, much more recently than, than the appearance of butterflies. Um, oh, okay. So it's not that they've been around for longer. I think it's more to do with the fact that they, um, partly at least to do with their, their social lifestyle. They have this kind of very complicated uh, life history uh, with all these interesting interactions between the queen and the workers and and, and the, the workers have um, kind of conflicts with each other. And is that people think of, of social insects like bees as living in this kind of very harmonious um, nest where they, you know, they're all working for the common good, serving their queen, gathering food and selflessly slaving away. But actually they're, they're, they're not such self, selfless creatures at all. They can be pretty unpleasant really. They're actually behaving in selfishly um, and inside bumblebee nests, the, I mean, it's quite common, for example, for um, workers sometimes try to lay their own eggs, um, the workers being the daughters of the queen. And if she catches them laying eggs, she immediately eats those eggs, uh, which are her grandson. Yeah. Um, <laughs> will beat up the workers and, you know, bite them and sort of roll them around a bit and sort of duff them up for, for having dared to try and lay an egg in her nest. Um, and, and sometimes in, in return, the workers will gang up and kill, their, kill the queen, their mom. Um, and so, so they're, they're quite brutal. And the, you know, this notion that they're, they're terribly peaceful and harmonious little creatures is, is somewhat misleading. Um, but maybe that's part of the reason why, why they've got relatively big brains. Um, but also they need them for, for, for the way they live um, to, to, fi to find enough food and bring it back to the nest to keep the nest ticking over. They have to be really efficient at, at foraging and you can only do that if you're clever. You know, a, a butterfly doesn't have the, the brain power to do all the things that bees do, but it doesn't I need it. I was gonna say, I mean, in a way, it sounds like it resembles human society. <laughs> but what I was gonna say was that you get the impression in your book and, and just hearing you talk now, 
they, they are existing right on the edge. Um, I mean, they're, they're very precarious in a way, aren't they? Because they require so much energy um, to, to... Yeah, I, bum, bumblebees are, are really weird insects, actually, because they, um, they, they thrive in cold places. You know, most insects are much more common in the tropics. They like sunshine, they like warmth. Uh, so there are many more species of butterfly or grasshopper or whatever in, in, in warmer regions. But bumblebees, are, are, they love cold weather, windy, rain, wet weather and so on. And that's, they're basically they're big and furry as an adaptation to keeping warm. Mm. And they generate their own by flapping their flight muscles. And so uh, bumblebees can fly around when the air temperatures are hovering or, around zero or even just below zero. But the inside of the bee... Um, will be 30 degrees or more while they're flying about. So there's an incredible difference in body temperature and between the body temperature and the, the air temperature, which no other insect or very few other insects can, can match. Yeah. Um, but the, as you say, that trouble with that is that it uses loads of energy. Um, so they're, you know, they, they're flapping their wings 200 times a second to, to generate the lift they need to fly and to generate the heat to keep warm which means they burn calories at a ferocious rate and a, a bumblebee is only ever about 40 minutes from being starving. And if they run out of energy, they can't take off, they can't warm up, they're in big trouble. Um, so, they, so they have to be good at finding, finding flowers. And I, I, I mentioned in, in A Sting in the Tales, this rather silly statistic someone once worked out that a, um, a, a running man uh, burns the calories in a Mars bar in about an hour of running, which is a fairly depressing statistic if you're running to burn off that moment of weakness when you ate the chocolate bar or whatever. Um, but if you were a man-sized bumblebee, you'd burn those calories in 30 seconds of flying. Uh, obviously, it's it's kind of a mind-boggling idea, a man-sized bumblebee. But it illustrates that basically they're burning calories like crazy the whole time they're active, which means that they need lots of flowers and they need to be good at finding. The key take-home, though, is that if if the landscape is too few in if flowers are too sparse then they just can't survive because they you know they can't get from flower to flower quickly enough and and that in essence is is the big reason why bumblebees have declined i was kind of encouraged in the sense that you know we hear that we should plant bee friendly plants in our garden and i'd like you to give us an idea of what those are in a second but um it does sound like it actually will make a big difference because you sort of think, oh, you know, this is to do with agriculture and changes in agriculture and so on. Can it really make any difference if I plant a few plants in my garden? But actually it really can because they're very local, aren't they? And they, they need immense amount of energy in a small area, in a local area. But bumblebees can thrive in, in urban areas. And that's something that I was, I was really quite surprised when I, we first worked this out a few years ago that um, if you put a bumblebee, a young bumblebee nest in a, in a suburban area um, and uh, or put it in farmland, the, the ones that you put in urban areas grow much faster and get much bigger than the ones in farmland typically. Yeah. So we most town dwellers think of the countryside as where wildlife lives, but actually for a lot of wildlife, the countryside's quite inhospitable these days, whereas gardens can be pretty, pretty good. And, uh, of course, not every garden is good, but but quite a lot are. And the bumblebees obviously will happily fly from garden to garden. You know, they don't care about the fences or the hedges or whatever. Uh, so in urban areas, they stand a much better chance of finding enough flowers than, than, than in farmland, which is kind of a bit depressing in terms of how farming has gone and how it reflects on that. But, uh, but also encouraging because it, it shows that, you know, it's worthwhile growing bee-friendly flowers in your garden. Yeah. And, you know, I don't have figures for, for other countries, but, um, but, but in the UK, there are, there are about 22 million gardens covering an area of, it's, it's about half a million hectares, which is a bigger area than all the nature reserves in Britain. Um, and if, if, you know, imagine they were all, mo most of them were, were wildlife-friendly mm -hmm. gardens, full of flowers, free from pesticides and so on. And imagine if we could also add in um, you know, get councils on board so that the parks were full of flowers, the cemeteries, the road verges, the roundabouts, all these other urban green spaces that would then connect up the towns via the road verges and the railway cuttings and so on. 
you've got a, a kind of national network of, of yeah. uh, wildlife friendly habitats just there for the making because garden centers are cottoning on to this and you know the local garden center here does have you know at the moment it's featuring bee friendly plants and stuff so it's fairly easy it's fairly obvious kind of they're plonking them right in front of your nose and it, and it does yeah, matter it, it's easy to do it's it's i mean there's lots of information about which plants to grow the bumblebee conservation trust website is great i've made lots of youtube videos about the best flowers for pollinators so it's it's very easy to find them. Garden centers usually put some kind of bee logo on the, the plants that are attractive to bees. Um, so, and people are, that's what's kind of exciting for me is this is already happening. This is not just my wishful thinking. Yeah. Lots no, of people are make, sort of inviting wildlife into their gardens. They want them to be full of bumblebees and butterflies and birdsong and everything else. Not everybody, and we've obviously, there's quite a few people to win over still. Um, but it's happening and and I think that's really exciting and it's kind of empowering because it you know a lot of environmental issues people feel completely helpless you know absolutely you see the rest on fire on the news and things like that and you you know it's really depressing and you can't think of anything you can do that's going to stop it but yeah. these insect decline we can all get involved in in helping you know mm -hmm. in our back garden well, it's so great. You're anticipating all my questions and I feel rather bad kind of getting you to go back and talk about the decline of bumblebees because in a way we've moved on to the resurgence of bumblebees. And I mean, one of the things in sort of planning this project, so maybe people should just read your book, The Decline of Bumblebees. Um, the, I mean, what I was going to say was that one of the things in, in that sort of led me to begin with Nature 2020 was this kind of shocking realization that declines in vertebrate species, in insects, in all of these things had really corresponded with my lifetime. And that's what just kind of made me think, oh my, oh my goodness, what's going to happen in the next generation, which obviously includes my children and your child too. And, you know, you sort of think if that's happened since the 70s, where are we going to be by the time they're my age? But you could also flip the coin and say, if we do the right things now, maybe populations can recover almost as quickly as they collapsed. Do you think, do you think so? They, they can, they, 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 they really could. Uh, we could turn this around. Um, it, certainly insects, you know, they can breed really fast. If you just provide them with the right conditions, some habitat, some food, stop poisoning them, somewhere to nest. You know, they're, they're, in just a few years, you could have huge numbers of insects back. You know, a few have gone extinct and obviously they aren't coming back, but most of them haven't yet gone extinct. And, you know, we could save them, but we need to act now. Um, you know, tomorrow will be probably too late. Um, so we need to, to, to try and, you know, make our gardens more insect friendly. We need to badger the council, the local authority to, to make parks and other areas more insect friendly. But we also do need to think about farming um, yeah. because sadly you know one of the biggest drivers of of biodiversity loss has been the the, the intensification and sp and spread of far of farming practices that that are i don't think sustainable in the long term you know we, we've come up with an intensive farming system with these huge fields with monocultures of crops treated with lots of fertilizers and pesticides um it's a major contributor to climate change. It's wiping out biodiversity and it's destroying the soil, which you know we, we desperately need as well as pollinators if we're gonna grow crops in the future. So we, we do really need to think about that. And that's a much harder fix than gardening. Um, making our gardens wildlife friendly is a great start, but we, sh we shouldn't think that that alone is going to solve all of our problems. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, but while you're talking about that, I'm really excited that um, uh, I'm pretty sure his name is Professor Tim Benton, who wrote a Chatham House report that's a policy think tank in Britain that in February published a big report on what governments need to consider in terms of food security and biodiversity. And they identify three levers uh, which they say governments need to consider in order to um, protect biodiversity or improve the situation for biodiversity while enabling us to produce food. I must say, I keep coming up against this wall in researching this project, which is 
there are just so many people. And I know this is such a dangerous and tricky area to discuss, but I don't know if it's possible for this planet to produce enough food for us it, without it. It is. It really, it really is. I mean, I, I, it, I, I get very frustrated because this sort of mantra that's often trotted out is that we need intensive farming to feed everyone. Um, and if you if you try to do it, if to to object to intensive farming, then you're you're basically going to cause people to starve. Uh, that is nonsense. Um, I mean, the current system is incredibly inefficient. Uh, about eighty percent of the world's land is used to produce meat and dairy products, which is just a ridiculously inefficient way of feeding people. We grow currently. We grow about three times as much food. In terms of raw calories that we need to feed everybody but then we waste about a third of it and we feed another third very roughly to animals rather than feeding it to people so that the the current and the current system is doing all this environmental damage that i mentioned a minute ago mm. Mm. Um, so we need to acknowledge that the current system is terrible and and work on ways to to fix it things like reduce i mean it's a really glib and easy thing to say but just supposing you know we could get rid of half, we could halve food waste globally. That means a, a, a sixth of all the farmland in the world could be turned over to nature. Um, nice. I mean, that, you know, right. that is a staggering area. That's yeah. an area the size of the United States that we could rewild or, or yeah. you know, whatever by, by reducing food waste. Yeah. Um, I th think we shouldn't accept food production and biodiversity as being mutually exclusive. They, they have essentially become like that. that Places where we grow food intensively have almost no life at all. Um, but they, you can grow food in a way that supports diversity. And, it, and I actually, I think that's the only sustainable way to grow food. And if you look at, you know, there are some really interesting models of agriculture, things like permaculture, biodynamic farming, agroforestry, some types of small scale organic farming, where they're focused on kind of working with nature rather than against it, where you, you can have lots of biodiversity with high levels of production of fruits and vegetables that are healthy for us to eat, really rich soils, lots of pollinators to pollinate the crops. They tend to be more labor intensive. Mm. Um, but, you know, there's 8 billion of us nearly on the planet. We're not short of people. Um, and we're con maybe, con I know. maybe a lot of people would actually be happier going back to kind of having a bit more of, I don't know, it's probably a really romantic, bucolic, kind of naive idea. But, you know, when you read kind of, I don't know, being British, I kind of think of literature like Thomas Hardy and stuff. But, you know, just, just um, I know that I've not been in the studio so much doing this project. And I've been on the laptop the whole time sending emails. And I go out in the garden for a few minutes and I just feel better. Or I go in the woods and I feel better. And having read uh, the, the overstory, you know, and this idea of the trees actually communicating with one another through pheromones or whatever it is, organic molecules they use to communicate. I don't know the details, but I, it really, I really thought, my God, yeah, nature makes you feel better, um, actually chemically, <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's tons of scientific studies showing exactly that, that, you know, we are happier and healthier if, if we regularly go out into nature, whether, and, and the more biodiversity is, the more different birds you can hear singing, the more different butterflies you can see, the happier you are. I and mean, it sounds slightly nuts, but it, it, it is simply true that the, yeah. we're meant to be outdoors in, in nature and, yeah. You know, being indoors all the time, staring at a screen, it's does really... not make us happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, listen, we feel I feel we've strayed slightly from the bumblebee, but I feel that we've actually covered really important things to do with the bumblebee, because in the end, we're talking about bumblebee survival. But if you could just describe a little bit the, the way in which they maintain their body temperature, because that was something really striking for me, that I thought mammals maintain their body temp internal body temperature. I had no idea that insects and bumblebees could do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I remember when I was at school being taught by my biology teacher that insects are cold-blooded, you know, and that, as you say, only mammals and birds that have a kind of regulated stable body temperature that with heat that's produced internally but that isn't quite true it's largely true most insects are 
cold blooded. Their, their body temperature is the same as, as, the, as the environment they're in. But a few big insects and um, bumblebees and uh, hawk moths, some of the really big furry moths are the best known examples. They're more like us than other insects. They, they, they generate heat internally um, through muscle activity and the fur helps to keep it in. Mm. Um, and and that's, you know, that is, is an adaptation to, to living in cool climates. So the, if you look at the kind of real hotspots for bumblebees in the world, they're places like the Himalayas, the Alps, and there are, there's, a, there's even bumblebee species that live in the Arctic Circle where hardly most insects, it's never warm enough for them to fly. Yeah. Um, but Bombus pelagus, it's a great name, um, lives its entire life cycle inside the Arctic Circle in that brief Arctic summer. And it, the, the air temperature is rarely much above freezing, but they can fly around quite happily from flower to flower. Yeah. Um, but as we were saying earlier, yeah, there, is, there is a price they pay, which is that, you know, it, it uses a, a ton of energy to do that. Yeah. Um, and so they need to buy lots of flowers. Let me just ask, I mean, nobody's typed any questions, but if anyone does have a question to ask, can you type it in the chat so that, and if not, I will just carry on with just one or two more questions. Um, no questions coming at the moment, so let me carry on um, and just say um, you, uh, you quote this biologist, oh, hang on. Oh, someone says, you've covered everything so well so far, I don't have anything specific to add. And I happen to know the person who put that question. She's a student here in Denmark, and actually in their school, they planted a bee-friendly garden. So uh, oh. I'm hoping to go and visit it. Yeah, they were the first school to kind of get back to me when I said I was looking to schools to help create this, get involved in creating this giant bumblebee. And they have planted a bee friendly garden at Arahoy, so that's really good. Um, no, the final thing I wanted to uh, raise really, I mean, was that uh, you quote the biologist E.O. Wilson in your book, In Sting in the Tail, and, and he says, um, basically, if humans were to disappear tomorrow, the world would return to this kind of rich, <laughs> rich uh, biodiverse Eden that it once was, but if insects disappeared tomorrow, we would um, descend into ecological chaos. Um, before you respond to that one, can you just give me a picture of how you imagine that Eden? Because you kind of describe it at a certain point when you're describing the evolution of the bee from the wasp. Um, you describe how, you know, once upon a time there were no flowers and so on, and it was all just kind of green. Um, can you just conjure up that picture, because it's such a beautiful picture of how the world was sort of 80 million years ago or thereabouts, that we might return yeah, to? Yeah, more, more than that. Um, I mean, insect pollination started more like 300 million years ago, so way, way, way back in, you know, in, in Earth's history. Um, and it's, it is hard to imagine, you know, a world without flowers. Um, we take them so much for, for granted, but uh, the early plants, they, they were largely wind pollinated. So they just, and obviously there are still wind pollinated plants today, the grasses and some coniferous trees and so on, they just throw their pollen onto the wind and, and hope by pure chance that, that a, some of that pollen ends up landing on a female flower of the same species species which is incredibly wasteful and you know 99.99 percent of that pollen goes to waste um, but at some point um, in a plant switch to to being pollinated by insects and it's pr it was probably brought about by some fairly primitive insects um, visiting flowers eating the pollen um, uh, because it would have been nutritious and going in search of it and that and accidentally transferring pollen from tree to tree or plant to plant in that way and then plants obviously they didn't think about it plants don't think but they they cottoned on to the fact that actually if they if they evolved things that were made the, their flowers more attractive to insects they got pollinated better so evolution selected for um, flowers that had the beginnings of little petals or or scents that were attractive to to insects and, they, and then it just exploded in this diversification because it was so successful 
uh, having insects pollinate your, your flowers rather than using the wind, that the plants that went down that route proliferated, the insects that were pollinating them proliferated, and there was this great explosion uh, of plant diversity and of flower diversity that suddenly the whole you know, world burst into bloom. It just, just reminded me to say uh, something which is important, which is, isn't all about bees, you know, the, this is about insects in general and really about life in general, you know, the, the, the environment. The bee, bees make quite a good sort of poster child for, for insect conservation because people like bees, most people do, and they, uh, most people are at least dimly aware that bees are important because of pollination of crops. Yeah. Um, far fewer people realize is that actually that, that insects do lots of other things too. Um, for, for one, there are lots of types of insects that pollinate that aren't bees, which is something that many people don't realize. But also insects are vital for, you know, yeah, including cycle all sorts. Be beetles are also rather important, aren't they? Pollinators. That's something I heard the other day that, again, I hadn't really thought much about. Beetles as pollinators. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there, uh, there are thousands of species of beetle that, that pollinate flowers. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it isn't, it's, uh, bees are a good starting point to kind of get people talking and thinking about looking after uh, insects. But uh, we shouldn't stop with bees. We, you know, they're all important. And we, I mean, we, it, the two thirds of all life on our planet are different types of insect. You know, they are biodiversity. Um, and so the, all this sort of evidence that they're disappearing is, is, should really worry us, not just because of crop pollination and, and the decline of bees. But let's, should we have a look at some of the questions? Absolutely, yeah. What, Robin says, what flowers are especially bee friendly? I mean, there's actually loads to choose from, and many of them are really beautiful. You know, you don't have to have a garden full of sort of ugly plants to, to, for it to be wildlife friendly. Um, I mean, generally, old-fashioned perennial and biennial plants and herbs uh, what what in english we call them cottage garden plants i don't know if there's a sort of a similar phrase used in other european countries but things like um mint and lavender and borage and um say sage marjoram is a fantastic plant for bees mm. um but there's lots of advice out there about which ones are best um you need, if you can, to try and provide flowers that flower at different times, um, uh, because particularly for bumblebees, they're on the wing from kind of late February, March, right through to September. So you need for their nests to thrive. They need flowers right through that period from. So in, when the queens first emerge from hibernation, they're starving, hungry. They haven't had anything to eat for perhaps eight months. Um, and so those early spring flowers are really important. So things like um, pulmonaria um, and pussy willow, salix, um, uh, grape hyacinth. Sorry, if, if you're not English, giving you English names probably is of no help at all. <laughs> but uh... There's a lot of willow around here. And I, I remember you mentioned in your book about the queens. That's one of the things that they're really dependent on uh, in the very yeah. early absolutely they 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 love it and it's a, it's quite a beautiful tree to, to grow if you've got room and not everyone has room in their garden for trees but you can get dwarf willows um actually they're, they're suitable for pretty small gardens and uh, you know they're very pretty with these yellow fluffy catkins in the spring and bees go mad for them i've seen um, a lot of people actually here or i've seen a number of people actually making beautiful teepees and hedges you know fences living fences out of kind of willows yes. i mean yeah that's, be creative yeah yeah they're really beautiful and then someone's asked about how many species of bumblebees have gone extinct in the last 20 years so far as we know only one um, globally lots lots of them have undergone national level extinctions um all over europe and the world but the only one that has that we know for sure has disappeared entirely is Franklin's bumblebee, which is a North American species that used to live in California and Oregon um, and sadly hasn't now been seen since 2006 and it seems more or less certain that it's extinct. That is a shame. Then um, someone says, would you buy plants or seeds or would you let seeds from the local area come instead in a garden? As in, oh, that's quite a good question in a way because it's like, 
a kind of corridor. I mean, it's uh, if I understood correctly, it's kind of about trying to kind of continue whatever is in your local area, the same type of, so that there's a large area, because presumably it is good for a bee to kind of have quite a large area of the same, of the same yes. type of As flower. long as they're attractive, rewarding flowers, the more the better. Um, and, and But it also, that question um, brings in the importance of native plants where you can, you know, we have, we, in Europe, we have beautiful native wildflowers, many of them really suitable for growing in a garden. Um, and on average, and this is, this is it's, a, it's a, um, a difficult generalization to make, but um, there is evidence that native flowers tend to be better than non-natives um, in terms of their attractiveness to pollinators. There are lots of exceptions to that. There are native plants that don't seem to attract any insects and there are non-natives that are super attractive uh, to, to insects. But on average, natives tend to be good. And some of my favorites, are, well, I already mentioned marjoram, origanum, bulgari, or uh, vipers bugloss is a lovely example of a native, so the, the Latin name of that is echium vulgari. Um, which uh, is a lovely example of a native wildflower, which looks glorious in the garden. It has great big spikes of purple flowers. Um, bees go absolutely mad for it. And mm -hmm. growing natives as, as being, being good for, for pollinators has the added advantage that, that you may also be providing food plant for other native insects, things like the caterpillars of butterflies. Um, so, most butterfly caterpillars are very specific about what they'll eat. They'll only eat a particular species of plant and they're all invariably native plants because that's what they've evolved with. So, um, you know, for example, if you want to have orange tip butterflies in your garden, um, Anth Anthocaris, I think is the Latin name, the beautiful little white butterflies with orange tips to their wings, which are on the wing now, actually. Yeah. They only lay their eggs on, on two or three species of closely related cabbage family plants, um, ladies smock, Cardamine pretensis is the uh, the favourite in my garden, which is a lovely little little pink flowered plant. Um, so if you grow that, then not only do you feed the bees on with the flowers, but you're also, if you're lucky, getting providing breeding habitat for native insects like butterflies. So there's a lot to be said for growing natives, but I don't think in gardens we should be obsessed about uh, only growing native plants. Um, and, and I think most gardeners would refuse to listen anyway if you said you mustn't grow any non-natives. Um, in, in an urban area, I, I see no harm in mixing them up. Um, Dave, and, you know, people are really warming up now and there are lots of questions <laughs> flying in. Can you oh, I better give shorter answers then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you look in the chat, chat, we've got when intensive unsustainable farming is the biggest cause of loss, biodiversity loss. How do we get involved to push for that coming to an end? I mean, yeah, it is. It is a good. It is a good question, isn't it? I mean, how many of us really have time to write to our local MP or whatever the equivalent is? I suppose there, it's where supporting charities like kind of uh, charities NGOs who are really campaigning on a larger, at a higher sort of policy level, maybe. Yeah. So just I, absolutely, that's one avenue. I mean, uh, the it is really difficult. You know, the, the, this is one of the sort of major challenges. I I think actually probably the biggest challenge that mankind faces is working out how do we feed everyone at the same time as looking after the planet, looking after the environment. Because you know we, we're doing a pretty poor job of that at the moment. But it's not a, you know it's not simple to fix and. It's a bit like trying to change direction with an oil tanker, you know, there's a lot of invested interest in what we do at present. There are big companies that, you know, manufacture pesticides and so on that don't want to change. Um, so it is hard, but there are simple things we can do. And, and I guess the most basic thing is to, to your own buying choices, you know, buy organic food, buy locally grown food, buy seasonal produce rather than you know, stuff flown in from the other side of the world. So support farms that are growing the right kind, you know, food in, in a more environmentally sustainable way. Yeah. And to, to, to an extreme, or, you know, to, to, to illustrate the power of that approach, if everyone bought organic food, there would be no pesticides in the world. 
you might say not everyone can afford organic food and so on. So it, and, and there's probably some truth in that, but most of us could in Europe, I think. Um, and if more of us bought it, it would get cheaper and, and uh, yeah. you know, would become more mainstream. Yeah. Um, so, so that, you know, is a really, oh, grow your own food. So you buy less, you know, getting people involved in getting an allotment or digging up a bit of their garden and creating their own vegetable patch. It reconnects with nature um, and with where food comes from. And I, 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 you know, of course, we can't all grow everything. You know, we can't be self-sufficient, but every bit of food you grow in your own garden is a bit of food that you didn't buy from the supermarket. And that can only be a good thing. Somebody asks, why is it better not to use fertilizers or is it only for the butterflies? I don't know. Are we supposed not to use fertilizers? I've heard a lot about pesticides. I make my own compost from vegetable waste, but are fertilizers bad? I do feed the, the garden the lawn. Is that bad? So synthetic fertilizers are quite bad. Um, uh, so um, they, um, it takes a lot, of, it produces a lot of greenhouse gases to manufacture them in the first place. Um, and they have really profound effects on, on, on ecosystems, um, unfortunately, negative effects. Um, so obviously most fertilizer is used by, in farming. And it, it, it unfortunately means that, that the land has become, is much more fertile than it used to be, including the hedgerows and the field margins. Um, so if you go for a walk in the countryside, you see very few flowers these days. You see lots of nettles and docks, um, which are fast growing plants that love high fertility. And they've swamped all the flowers that used to grow in our hedgerows because of the fertilizers that are being applied regularly. And similarly, fertilizers leach into rivers and they cause these algal blooms, which kill everything. Um, so fertilizers can uh, have a, a lot of negative effects on the environment. Natural fertilizers, you know, using using dung, or cre if you're in a garden, um, creating your own liquid compost by, I, and I use nettles and comfrey and put them in a in a barrel of water and let them rot down. And you get this beautiful kind of tea. Uh, mm. It smells but makes plants grow like crazy um, <laughs> i've read so, about that yeah. i might try that with some it's, it's a good way of yep making Sorry, go on. neighbors unhappy <laughs> with the smell um can you reintroduce a species if it's gone extinct in one area or land to another and is it done somewhere and did it work it's been done successfully with butterflies um so for example, um, the large blue butterfly, Maculinia uh, arian, is actually, I think they might have changed its Latin name, which is not very helpful. But anyway, it's a lovely, blue, very rare, it's a, a blue butterfly that went extinct in the United Kingdom um, and was reintroduced from Sweden uh, successfully in the 1980s, I think, um, and is now doing quite well. But it's a very expensive business and when you think how many thousands or well millions of species of insect there are in the world um you know we can't really be in the business of of you know manually reintroducing them one at a time to places they've died out or at least we can't do much of that no they're um, doing it with the checkered skipper aren't they as well because that was going to be one of yes. us in rockingham the checkered yes skipper, yes that, that, so so it can be done we, we've tried it with a bumblebee that was the, the short-haired bumblebee that went extinct in the UK, but that hasn't worked so far, oh, sadly. Right. One that was in uh, New Zealand. It yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, really interesting story, which I'm not sure we've got time to go into now, but uh, um, but it's, it, the truth is that those, they, it costs you know lots of money, lots of manpower. You need to recreate the habitat to prepare the ground for, for a reintroduction. It's not a simple thing to do. Much better to not lose them in the first place. Yeah, though. and I suppose like the same problems that made it go extinct in the first place, they've not been solved. <laughs> it's going to happen again. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think treating the cause of the problem is probably a more efficient way of doing things than than trying to kind of you know undo the damage retrospectively by reintroducing things once they're gone. Well, listen, thank you so much because also, I mean, I think it's very helpful because you've got some of these statistics just at your fingertips, you know, about world farming and stuff. Because I, I think what happens as an individual often is you 
you sort of are vaguely aware of news stories and stuff like that, but actually having someone giving you an overview that, that tells you, that puts things in perspective, really. What is the single biggest problem? I mean, certainly listening to you and, and working on this project, I've become more and more convinced that really switching over from a more meat-based diet to a more vegetable-based diet is probably the single most important thing that any individual can do. It really, that message, you know, that is beginning to come across in the news is actually an important message to take on board. Because when you said, what, 80% of the world's yeah. land? Given yeah. over to rearing... It's, it's mad, isn't it? And it, it produces about 8% of the calories that we consume um, come from animals. And it, so 80% of the land produces 8% of the food, which obviously means that 20% of the land is producing the other 92%. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a no-brain. It is. Um, we've, we've got a really inefficient system at the moment. And if we could just, you know, address some really simple things, as you say, eat less meat um, and waste less food, two really simple things, it could make a huge effect. Uh, you know, benefit, benefit I actually had well. an idea in Denmark. I was thinking, because I was reading a Greenpeace newsletter where they said, they were talking about food waste, uh, but they were they were talking about pigs eating soya, you know, and soya grown on what was the Amazon rainforest and stuff like that. And I, I just wondered, I don't know if this has been done anywhere, about using food waste from supermarkets to feed pigs. I mean, could the pigs not be eating, you know, all the waste food from the supermarket? I, I, th I think I could be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure there are kind of health and sa safety regulations that prevent that. Uh. Um, <laughs> the concern that you might end up feeding, you know, animal products back to the pigs by accident and, you know, end up with give them, yeah, uh, mad cow disease, <laughs> mad pig disease or something. I, I think that's the, the motivation, but it does seem like a terrible shame that we don't make better use. You know, maybe one, one solution might be to feed that waste to insects and use them as food. <laughs> Can be done, people are looking into it. We're going to eat insects. Okay. Oh, no, not oh. wild ones. I'm not suggesting we catch them in the wild to eat. There aren't enough for that, but they they can be mass reared, and they're much more. You can rear them much more efficiently than than cows or pigs. Um, yeah. They, they, you get a much better conversion of of uh, food to something that humans can eat. Protein. Just like eating insects. So it's. Um, I can't say I find it very appetizing, but I could learn. I think, but yeah. <laughs> Um, let's just see. Um, yeah, so people are sort of mostly agreeing now, I think, with what we're saying. And I feel as if we're kind of coming to a, a natural conclusion. And um, well, all that remains really, Dave, is to say thanks so much for giving us your time today. It's just really wonderful. I've really enjoyed reading your book. And um, I haven't read the uh, the latest one, Gardening to Bumblebees, but I will. But no, just thank you so much. And, and also thank you for supporting the project, because I didn't mention that you'd supported with Nature 2020, not financially, of course, just by lending your name to it. But that meant so much in the early days, I think, having emails where I could send out an email with some recognisable names at the bottom, I think really lent some weight. So thank you. People are saying thank you so much. Pleasure. And, Really, it's been wonderful. Can I just flag up? I have a, a new book, Silent Earth, coming out in this summer, um, which is all about insect declines and how we can fix them, basically. Hey, okay. is, um, is that a reference to Silent Spring? I mean, the title reminds uh -huh. me. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit cheeky of me to <laughs> co-opt the title, but, uh, um, but yes, uh, it's about what a mess we're making, really. But how, how with the final third of the book is about how we could fix it all um, if only the will was there well I hope I mean yeah uh, that's what we're trying to do with the project to uh, kind of celebrate biodiversity how many people will see it I don't know but I mean I, I just think with every person that is becoming more aware that's the only thing we can do and, and try and sort of um, bring this before the noses of our leaders and uh, 
Yeah, but in the end, probably it'll be the financial incentive, I guess. The financial incentive that, you know, investment houses are beginning to realise that the way things are going is actually leading to catastrophe and that's not going to make money. And therefore, <laughs> maybe the financial incentive is what will eventually pers persuade the vested interests and the governments. But thank you. And Something does. That's all that matters, really. But, uh, yeah, anyway, it's been a pleasure. It's been lovely to meet you. And yeah. uh, thank you everyone for listening to me ramble on um yeah long with the bees thank you so we'll leave it there bye everybody thanks for coming bye bye bye